Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day two of EHI's annual meeting. We are coming together as we do once a year with our members just to look back at the past 12 months of what's been happening with the organization and with, with healthcare. And as we all know, COVID has been top of mind for, for 12 months and will probably continue, continue to be so. Uh, next slide, Catherine. Oh, we have a slight delay. So we're yep, gathering on I'm, the I'm go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I do want to recognize our members. Um, it is because of you that EHI is now celebrating 20 years of, of existence. And for that, we say thank you. To our new members who have just recently joined us, we say, we say thank you and, and welcome. As members, you do have access to webinars such as this and also our roundtables, and we offer our members access to our, access to our, um, our work groups. Um, so please go to ehidc.org um, to look at current events and to also see what the work groups are up to. We have three of them, one in data analytics, we have a policy work group, excuse me, and there's a, um, a, data, a data work group. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. And as you all know, we are continuing to focus on four, four areas, um, consumer privacy for health data, our virtual care and, and telemedicine, our analytics, SDOH, and our COVID-19 back practices in education. Uh, these will continue to be critical areas as we've seen um, in the healthcare landscape. These will, uh, they are the most important issues um, with data and with COVID. And this is why we bring our members together um, to, to offer programs such as this and some of our webinars during the year so that we can talk about these important issues that not only lead to uh, thought leadership, but out of them, we have um, calls to action. And hopefully, you within the organization, you take this conversation back into, uh, back into your work. And then, you know, we can, we can influence that. Next slide. Last year was a really busy year for us. Uh, we published a number of publications and we're gonna be publishing and continue to publish this year. Um, we certainly put a few out on SDOH and on COVID and uh, telemedicine. And these are currently on our website in our resource center. So at any time, please go to the resource center and, and download these, these reports. Next slide. And we have a number of webinars that are coming. Uh, we've been, we're gonna be very busy in February and March. This is just a sample of what we have upcoming for you. Uh, continue to, you will see notices about this in our weekend reading um, as we continue to promote our other webinars and uh, send out information you will see that this list will grow and there'll be more and more webinars. We encourage all of you to attend as many as you can. Um, and if you can't attend, it's okay. We keep a recording of the video online and we also have a copy of the information from the program. So you can always access this at, at any time. And again, for a full list of what's coming up, look at our website under the events section. Next slide, please. And we've had a busy year already. It's only the third week of January, and we've already had three webinars on SDOH and in COVID. So that really gives you an idea of, of what to expect in February through December. Um, most recently, we talked about diversity in clinical trials, um, which is extremely important as we get to this, this area of uh, COVID vaccine and where we are and, and moving forward. We did a lot of focus on, on data and, and strategies for patient engagement. Um, we even focused on a new population, Native American and Alaskan Native populations. As we all know, they're one of many populations who are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And so we have a number of exciting um, events about that as well. And we're going to continue the conversation in all of these areas. Next slide. Today, we have a really exciting panel for you. We'll be talking about um, prioritizing health equity in the COVID-19 vaccine distribution. As, as I'm sure all of us know, we are less than 30 days into COVID vaccine distribution. I can't believe we've been talking about this. 12 months ago, we were just at the beginning of what would become a global pandemic. And now here we are uh, 12 months later talking about a vaccine that exists. Uh, but the issue to really keep at the core is, is prioritizing health equity in that. And so all of my panelists today um, are gonna be talking about the work they've done at the community level, work with providers um, at the state and the federal level through the health system, really giving a 360 degree view of what it means to prioritize health equity in, in this health space 
and what has been done, and more importantly, what can be done. Next slide. Right after our panel, don't go away. We have another panel that's planned for you on, on virtual care delivery. This will be moderated by our CEO, Jim Kobush Bordenick. This is also going to be a very exciting topic. Virtual care has become the center of healthcare, I, I, I can say, during COVID-19. There's really been a shift in, in healthcare delivery and healthcare access. So please, after this panel, don't go away. Stay right here um, for, this, for the next panel. And with that, I'd like to invite my panelists today to, to join me. Next slide. First up, we have Dr. McGinnis from the National Academy of, of Medicine. Um, Dr. McGinnis, welcome. Thank you very much, Juane. Thank you. I will turn it over to you. Good. Uh, well, uh, I want to start off with uh, my three major points, uh, which are first, uh, gratitude uh, for the invitation um, and the opportunity to learn from my co-panelists. Um, uh, uh, secondly, uh, I want to underscore the importance uh, of uh, the topic of today to the academy and the academies as a whole. And thirdly, I want to underscore the importance of giving the first priority during the implementation of the vaccine nationally and globally to uh, underserved uh, populations. So let me uh, let me just revisit those uh, briefly. Um, first, on the gratitude dimension, uh, it's no there's no question that um, the future of health and healthcare and biomedical science, for that matter. Uh, is digital. Uh, indeed, it's the present, but it's clearly going to be the future. And the uh, focus that you're providing on ensuring that we use um, the digital capacities that uh, we're developing to first redress inequities that uh, have course throughout society uh, is vital. Uh, second, on the importance to the Academy, uh, the National Academy of Medicine and uh, all three academies, um, it, uh, it, one thing that has been clear throughout um, the course of this pandemic uh, is that the um, bulk, the, the, the major brunt of the impact has been on, uh, has fallen in an inequitable fashion upon those who are most vulnerable in our society. And indeed, um, we have, uh, as one might imagine, the National Academy of Medicine has been very extensively involved in the COVID uh, uh, activities, uh, both uh, public and private. Um, and and uh, indeed, in all three of the perfect storm elements that we've seen over the course of the past year, the pandemic itself, with the battle against the virus, the challenges to the healthcare uh, system, uh, that have uh, revealed uh, its vulnerabilities um, and the um, social dimension uh, and the bringing to the fore the social crisis that has been prevalent with in our midst for some times, but uh, has never been made as uh, patent as it has during uh, the course of the pandemic. All three of those are issues that are squarely um, in our sights. Uh, that we view as uh, fundamental obligations to engage in an effective manner, reaching out across um, our uh, cooperating and partner institutions. Um, and the third point that uh, I'll underscore uh, is the um, importance of implementing uh, and learning through that implementation process, um, how we can use as a um, as a uh, as an entering wedge of our uh, national vaccine implementation process uh, the focus on reaching uh, low income and vulnerable populations communities of color uh, as a first priority not only to uh, ensure that they get the priority that they deserve but that they are the leading wedge for broad system change that's necessary that we've learned about. And I'll mention that in just a second. Next slide, please. Our mission at the National Academy of Medicine is to improve health for all by advancing science, accelerating health equity, and I underscore that, 
uh, and providing independent, authoritative, and trusted advice nationally and globally. Uh, you may or may not know the National Academy uh, of Medicine is built on the charter, 1863 charter, signed by Lincoln uh, uh, for the National Academy of Sciences. And now we now work as three uh, independent, uh, non-governmental, uh, but uh, with a governmental license, if you will, uh, with a charter uh, to provide advice to the nation. Next slide, please. An example of uh, our being called upon to provide advice was the report that we did uh, um, in the fall, released in the fall, on the framework for equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine. It was a very um, uh, fast track process, as one might imagine. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, the committee did a splendid job uh, working as, it, as our committees do independently uh, to come up with the following recommendations in a matter of a few weeks time. And the recommendations relate to uh, ensuring that um, the necessary resources uh, are available to ensure equitable allocation of the vaccine. It, um, that a, a framework is developed that gives the highest priority to those most in need, that no out-of-pocket costs be incurred by uh, anyone receiving a vaccine, uh, that, and, and there are three elements, I should say, the next three items are all focused on communication because of the vital importance uh, of ensuring that people understood in the midst of this very dynamic process, its importance, um, that we overcome <clears throat> and set a pattern of overcoming vaccine resistance that has sometimes uh, crept into our social domain, and that we sustain that effort uh, to, of ongoing communication as a means to ensure that our frontline uh, involvement with folks at the community level uh, is one that uh, is not just momentary uh, uh, and transient, but is sustained over time. And then uh, finally, uh, in addition, clearly to tend to the importance of uh, ensuring our global, uh, uh, our global obligations and to work as we can to, uh, for equitable uh, vaccine availability globally. Next slide, please. The, uh, you won't be able to read this, but I'll give you a quick uh, flyby. Uh, the committee identified four phases. Uh, the first phase was uh, uh, focused on high-risk workers uh, and um, first responders. Uh, and then the second part, well, phase 1B, was focused on uh, people uh, who have uh, pre-existing conditions and older adults. Phase 2 uh, was focused on the issue of uh, workers who are in uh, circumstances that require interface with the public in order to ensure that the public has the groceries it needs and the care, uh, the, the routine care it needs and so forth. Uh, phase three was focused on young adults and children uh, and workers and in industries essential uh, to the functioning of uh, society, but not on the front line. And phase four, everyone else. The, uh, and you see as a cross cutting theme, equity was dominant at every stage. Next slide, please. The CDC, um, which has responsibility for the national guidelines, uh, has adopted for the most part the recommendations of the uh, Academy Committee uh, with some slight uh, amendments. But again, phase one is healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities. Uh, phase 1B is frontline workers and people age 75 and older. Uh, phase 1C is 65 and older those with uh, life-threatening uh, conditions. And uh, then moving to phase two is the uh, focus on other parts of the population. Um, I wanna underscore, next slide please. Let's just pause here because I've got two more slides that um, uh, I, I don't need to show you. you, they'll be available. I just wanna underscore uh, a few facts um, that give us the um, clear motivation and incentive uh, to uh, ensure that our primary focus and everything we do is focused on, um, on the issue of equity. Black or African-American, uh, uh, African-Americans um, experienced uh, COVID-19 cases at one and a half times 
the rate of uh, uh, of white non-Hispanic uh, cases. Um, blacks and African Americans and non-Hispanic persons were hospitalized um, at three and a, at three point seven times the rate of white non-Hispanic uh, uh, persons, and um, the death rates uh, for blacks or and African Americans was nearly three times, is nearly three times the rate of white non-Hispanic persons. So it's very clear that the uh, prominence of inequity uh, is undeniable uh, and, uh, and uh, hopefully will provide the kind of motivation for us as a society to give first priority uh, to uh, ensuring that those who are most vulnerable uh, are, are engaged in the vaccine process. I'll just make one other comment, looping back on uh, what we've learned about uh, from uh, public surveys and so forth, is that there is a, um, a, a measure of vaccine resistance uh, that's existing uh, throughout uh, society. Uh, that The consequences could be tragic. Um, and unfortunately, that vaccine resistance inclination um, seems to be higher among those uh, in low income and among African American populations. No, no surprise there because historically, the combination of our uh, uh, research process uh, misusing uh, its, um, uh, its um, tools, resources, and activities uh, in, um, in inequitable and, uh, and in some cases despicable fashions um, has ha had a long legacy. Um, and it's important that we, therefore, as we're undertaking the vaccine initiative, undertake it with great sensitivity uh, uh, and, great, um, uh, and, and great commitment to uh, especially work hard uh, to ensure uh, the engagement of those who are in, uh, in low income circumstances. I think that we have uh, a moment in many ways of, of opportunity. Opportunity to use this tragedy uh, of the over 400,000 people who have died in our nation uh, and of the economic burden uh, that um, uh, has um, fallen upon all of society uh, to redress uh, not just decades, uh, but centuries uh, of uh, of uh, problems that have uh, occurred, in, especially in African-American populations, um, as a result of systemic racism. And if we can devote our first energies very clearly uh, to making it clear that um, uh, our priority is to use this campaign as a means of making our commitment as a society clear to changing the circumstances in play, not just in health and healthcare, but throughout society, uh, we will uh, be able to uh, set the stage for broader societal progress. Thank you again for the opportunity. I'm really looking forward to hearing from my panelists uh, about their work at the front line to make a difference. Thank you, Dr. McGinnis, for that eye-opening presentation. Um, we actually have some time for a few questions uh, that have come in through, uh, through the Q&A. And the first question is, what are your thoughts about states who are facing vaccine shortages today? Um, and I'll, I'll expand on that question, but I'll let you answer that piece of it first. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the first uh, uh, answer is, is very clearly, and I know the president feels this very clearly, and that is, uh, where the national government has to play a stronger role in getting vaccine uh, out to the states and to the front lines. And I think that um, uh, there's no question that uh, in choosing uh, vaccine strategies when there isn't enough available, the first priority has to go to frontline healthcare workers and first responders. Uh, but after that, uh, I think that every state should look very carefully at, uh, at the priority that they can give to those who are uh, in underserved communities. And with, and with that, I wanna expand on that a little bit. Even those in underserved communities, what do you think um, are the best ways to, because you mentioned uh, systemic racism and healthcare. And so even if the vaccine were available for all, 
let's assume that there were no shortages in the states and it was available for everyone and everyone could go get it when they'd want to. Um, my assumption, or based on what I've seen, is that there would still be some hesitation to take the vaccine for, for a number of reasons. Um, some of it could be past clinical trauma amongst like different um, racial and ethnic groups. Some could be um, a mistrust of the healthcare system. So how do we uh, make sure that we don't widen that gap of disparity uh, by engaging the communities? We've made it available, but now how do we increase that awareness and, and, um, and increase that accessibility and, and those sorts of things so that we don't widen that gap in disparity and equity? That's a critical question. And, and my short answer would be um, from the air and on the ground. Uh, by that, I mean, um, we do need to use all means of communication, social media, uh, uh, broadcast, television, radio broadcast um, uh, uh, communications, as well as uh, partnerships with local community organizations uh, to uh, ensure that the educational process uh, is um, providing a reassuring drumbeat across, uh, uh, across all of the co communities that are at special risk. By on the ground, I mean, though, um, we need to be up close and personal. Uh, I worked uh, personally in the smallpox eradication program in India uh, nearly 50 years ago, uh, which was successful. We went to every uh, village house, um, uh, visited, visited every uh, household throughout the, uh, the areas uh, under, um, uh, under the, the worst pressures. Uh, of the epidemic uh, of smallpox, which is a very lethal disease. It, it killed about 25% uh, of, uh, of its victims. And the thing that really worked was our going literally door to door. And while we, we may not need to do that today, the, the uh, analogous effort to really reach out uh, uh, and get up close and personal uh, to uh, ensure that people are uh, receiving the attention they need, I think, is um, is relevant. Thank you. And one last question before I invite our, our next panelist. Um, just for everyone, we're, we are going to have a group discussion after, so please send the questions. Keep sending them through the, the Q and A, and we'll we'll get to them in the panel. Uh, but one last question, Dr. McGinnis. Um, we see that states are now opening up, so travel is opening up. Um, there seems to be a bit of a, a disconnect, if you will. Uh, as the states open up and travel, but uh, vaccinations are not synchronized along the, the, the opening schedule, if you will, meaning some people may not get vaccinated um, until the summer. Do you see that being a risk for COVID spreading to the point that we, we can't keep up with the vaccines at that point? Um, which I guess it's like, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> yeah, no, this is a, also a very important uh, question uh, because with the development of uh, and, the, and the use of vaccine, there's going to be a change in mindset. People are going to feel that they have uh, more license to, do, uh, to um, uh, do things a little more freely. Um, and we cannot let our vigilance down. Uh, it is extremely important that uh, people like me, for example, who has uh, had uh, immunization, wear my mask uh, and, and all of us set an example. I'm concerned about uh, the loosening of travel. I'm, uh, I, I do think it can be done safely. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, outdoor gatherings uh, and uh, for example, eating in restaurants and so forth can be done safely, but it has to be done extremely carefully uh, until we see uh, the trends going down and we are very deliberate about the ways in which we introduce our previous ways of life. Absolutely, thank you. I think that's the perfect way to, to, <laughs> to end that. Um, thank you again, Dr. McGinnis. Don't go away, we're gonna have our panel discussion after this. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Diana Zuskoff from LexisNexis to come to the stage and join us. Hi, hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning for those of you on the West Coast. And thank you, Wame and Jennifer and everyone from EHI for inviting me and uh, Lexus Texas to participate today. Um, I am, my background is in health communications um, and uh, 
I, I just want to echo everything Dr. McGinnis said. I think that was a great opening to the discussion in terms of uh, uh, really reaching people who are hard to reach. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some non-traditional data sources, uh, particularly kind of the role that um, a public records data aggregator like LexisNexis um, plays in, in this space. Um, we are working uh, with a couple partners um, around actually incorporating some of these non-traditional data sources into federal and state and uh, payer and provider um, vaccination efforts. And so, you know, I will try to kind of pepper that throughout, but if you do have questions, um, I think my contact information is on here, um, would be more than happy to uh, connect you to the right folks um, as well. And, and share some more information. So if we go on to the next slide, um, we just want to introduce a little bit about what, what do I mean when I say non-traditional data? And I'll do that in the context of, of what um, the LexisNexis public records uh, data set looks like and what it is, because um, I, I realize that uh, many, are, are, including myself before I took this role, are not necessarily familiar with this very, very rich data set out there. Um, you might hear public records sometimes referred to as consumer data, uh, very similar. Um, but really what it is, is a combination of both public and privately held uh, data around identities or individuals. Um, and we, we actually capture that data from over 10,000 data sources. So uh, realize that there's a lot on this slide, but if you kind of, let's go left to right with me. If we start on the left, um, we capture things like cell phone, uh, cell phone numbers, email addresses, vehicle registrations, criminal records, um, bankruptcy records, property records, and uh, all of those, um, again, you know, DMV registrations, everything that is both publicly available and then of course, um, credit data from the credit bureaus, some other kind of private sources of, of data and package that all together to look at really the full scope of an individual. Um, so if you really think about taking all of these little fragments of data that exist, whether it's in the digital space and in our public records, in our private life, and pulling that together to get a full view of an individual, um, and then thinking about what does that tell us about that individual in a healthcare context. And specifically, I focused on our government healthcare sector, um, have really close colleagues who are also EHI members, some of which are on the line, who focus on um, the payer provider life sciences side as well. And so what, what we've really curated is using all of that public records data to um, help predict and validate social determinants of health. But before I get into that social determinants of health space, I did just wanna mention, because we're all, we are all talking about COVID prevention and infection and vaccination, um, this data has been also very powerful for contact tracing efforts. And we're supporting uh, over a dozen states and actually giving them access to our data sets to be able to find the most recent phone number, the best email address, relatives, friends, neighbors of someone who has been identified uh, with COVID to, to also help that contact tracing effort. Um, as, a, as an entity, we also support uh, you know, data management, um, data enrichment, I mentioned contact tracing is a big focus for us, social determinants, which I'll get into. Um, and then of course, uh, some other kind of eligibility um, and particularly around Medicaid and SNAP um, program integrity and program eligibility programs as well. So if we go on to the next slide, I want to talk uh, specifically about our social determinants of health data set. Um, and so I mentioned we take all of those public records. And if you were looking at that um, slide that I had up, you'll see that a lot of the information we have is about neighborhood, about vehicle ownership, about um, home ownership, about income. And obviously, those are directly correlated with uh, social determinants of health. So our data science group has actually gone through and, and defined 400 plus attributes that are clinically validated against common health outcomes, high cost health outcomes to validate that these data, these attributes are actually predictive of social determinants of health and again, validated against those, those critical health outcomes. And with that, um, those 400 attributes, like I said, kind of provide that um, vision of a person uh, through social determinants. And then they're also kind of aggregated up a level into what we call care drivers. We've got 32 of those. And those are really um, where we're looking at actionable 
uh, intelligence. So noting that someone is lacking transportation um, and making sure that a care manager, a payer, or a state Medicaid agency has that kind of flag and make sure to say, when, we, when you are you know, in need of a vaccination, we also need to package that together with a transportation benefit um, or make you aware of a transfer, transfer, transportation excuse me, program. Um, so this is a little bit about our data set. I'm gonna kind of take that to life if we go on to the next slide. And um, really what I wanna kind of hammer home today is that zip codes, you know, we, we've all on this, on this call been very well convinced that, you know, zip codes drive morbidity, mortality, health disparities. We really all understand that as a public health enterprise now. Um, but I, I want to really call your attention to the fact that zip codes may not always tell the full picture. And this is where we are really, really encouraging um, as we're looking at vaccine prioritization and equitable distribution to be looking at the individual level. Um, because as you can see, we've got, you know, two women here, Alex and Lisa, clinically look very similar, have some diabetes and depression comorbidities, geographically look similar living in the same zip code, um, may both be covered by Medicaid, uh, giving them the same kind of health access profile. But you've got, you know, one who owns a car, one who doesn't, meaning that her ability to get to a CVS or a, a physician or a mass vaccination site are going to be very different. Um, also, that social support factor, right? Um, knowing that your nearest relative lives very close to you and can make sure to, you know, watch your kids while you're getting your vaccine or, you know, give you a ride versus someone who's more isolated might need multiple communication campaigns to reach out to them. Um, so again, really encourage you to look at that individual level um, to get those nuances on how to best outreach to people in an equitable manner. And if we go on to the la next slide, um, I really wanted to kind of drive home a couple things that we're seeing uh, as it relates to vaccine equity. And, and as I mentioned, um, this is work that's evolving day by day. Um, so I wanted to kind of share some lessons. I can't say that they're lessons learned because we're still learning, but things that I have been really uh, actively thinking about. Um, and if you have comments or questions on these, please uh, go ahead and, and add them in the chat or, um, or save them for the end. The first is, um, as we know, many, many of the people who need uh, the vaccine and those who are underserved and hard to reach may not have clinical data. Um, so models that are predicting risk or predicting need based on clinical data are may artif accidentally or artificially actually kind of exclude the hardest to reach folks. People who don't have a usual source of care, uh, people who maybe are even homeless or uninsured, um, may not have a regular primary care physician, may not be you know, uninsured, so they're not getting mailings from their payer. Uh, those are the folks who we really have to make sure to reach. And I think a great way to reach them is through uh, predicting their risk and their um, you know, ability to get the vaccine through, again, that social determinants of health lens. Because if we don't have a clinical history on them, we still need to be able to get some sort of data picture on them. The other thing, uh, and as I mentioned, is using those social determinants to prioritize the vaccine distribution. And that's work, as I mentioned, that we're doing with a partner who's actually a, an AI modeling company who's actually pulled in our SDOH data set into their um, process to try to, you know, again, kind of prioritize individuals within those 1A, 1B categories that Dr. McGinnis talked about. Um, we're, you know, piloting that with a um, couple of counties in California, as well as some payers in California. Um, and the results are really, really exciting to see, you know, how SDOH can actually really change kind of that prioritization and that uh, in the vaccine distribution. But it doesn't stop with prioritization, right? We know that this vaccination effort is going to take the better part of a year. Um, so continuing to monitor, are we reaching those hard to reach populations with something like an SDOH data set or with public records is critical um, because we're not necessarily going to have that clinical data again to monitor them over time. And last but not least, I mentioned the care drivers. You know, we, we 
to achieve vaccine equity, we really have to be thinking about this in a health disparities lens. And so all of the gaps that we have to close to get someone to a doctor's appointment, we have to close those same gaps to get them to a vaccine appointment. So again, thinking about make sure, making sure they have access to care, access to transportation, uh, community resources as needed, um, really, really critical. And, and again, that's something that non-traditional data can really help with. So with that, uh, let me pause and see 1A if you had any questions to share from the audience or anything else you wanted to hit on before we move on. Yes, no, this was this was great. I, I've, I've seen parts of this before and I, I love it. I love this whole idea of um, we're not defined by our zip code. I think that I think that's so important. And even with the best of intentions, I think, you know, it's one of those instances where um, collecting data can cause what I call unintended consequences. In which meaning that some people will be overlooked, you know, will not receive the services. So I love this, I love this, this whole person approach um, with, with the data collection. But I do have a question that's come up in the QA and it's, and it's around data privacy, which I think is a really important point to hit on as well. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any barriers accessing data from the, the federal government? And when there any, and how did you, how did you overcome that? And, and do you still have those, those challenges now, now that we're in a pandemic and data sharing is just so, so important? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And it, it is a, a very thoughtful point. Um, I, you know, one of the challenges um, originally, um, we were, you know, in conversations with some of the federal government to actually apply some of these SDOH data sources um, into the, the federal distribution program. Um, one of the challenges there has been, um, you know, as, as everyone on this call knows, we don't have a, a great, you know, federal sort of data system that can tell us, here is all of the, you know, all of the patients that we need to score, all of the patients that we need to match data for. So on a federal level, that certainly has been a, a challenge. Um, we have made really, really great uh, inroads with um, some federal partners, whether that's uh, the VA or, um, or CMS, where there is a, a direct population that they're managing. And so that is one way it's on the federal side. Um, uh, however, on the state side, you know, there, certainly there are concerns around data privacy and, and I share those and we take that very, very seriously. Um, anyone who uses this data set does have to go through a proper credentialing process to make sure that, you know, the data is stored securely, that we're using it in the right context. And so I definitely do not want to gloss over those concerns. Um, but I do want to mention that, you know, this, this data um, can be used without clinical claims. And I do think that that helps get some of these projects off the ground um, because it does, you know, advance kind of kind of reduce that, that um, footprint of data that has to be shared. We can take out the clinical data and just focus on the social data. And so for us to, to leverage the social data, um, we do work with states and counties and, and we can do that just with getting kind of a, a list of patients um, or a list of zip codes that we're focusing on, whether it's a county or a state um, and, and go that way. And again, if, if folks on this call are interested, um, if you're a provider or a payer and you have a specific population you're trying to reach, we can um, work with you on that. If you're a government entity, we can work with you on how to um, best access that data as well. Well, here's a question. Um, you talk about non-clinical data um, and which I think is very, very important. Um, in and you asked about specific populations. So in the case of say the homeless population, which we know is an extremely vulnerable population um, who will have very, very little clinical data and will likely not have, you know, won't have an address. So there's really no way to, to, to reach out to them unless there's like direct outreach. Um, in your data collection, and um, not to put you on the spot, but in data collection, have you accounted for, for populations like that who don't fall in the, in the box of having uh, non-clinical data, but may have, you know, other data points available. There's just like no data and you just really have to dig a little bit deeper. Have you accounted for that or something that you yeah. can yeah, it's a great question. It's something that we're always kind of um, fine tuning. Um, we are working with a couple of states specifically on on modeling homelessness um, and and making sure that our data does and generally our data does cover um, homeless individuals fairly well. Um, if you think about it, you know there are still some paper trails, so to mm -hmm. so to speak, and that's where public records data. Um, really does kind of paint that picture in a way that you might not get from a, a clinical interaction. Um, the other tool that we found really helpful is also identifying 
Um, you know, if we don't have a current address, we can look at previous address. And so we are able to model address history, which has been very, very helpful. The other thing is um, oftentimes we can look at networks. And so looking at, you know, where, where might we be able to target that person's family, friends, neighbors, again, in an appropriate way, we're not gonna say, hey, make sure Susie comes in for, their, for her vaccine, but making sure that people in that neighborhood or in that social network are also aware of the vaccination efforts. Um, and last but not least, you know, I am a digital health person, uh, and I know you have a panel on digital health after this. I want to underscore that um, don't underestimate the fact that, um, you know, people experiencing homelessness often do still have a best phone number to reach them. And that is data that would be in our data set, but is also another great way to reach out to them. So that's a great point. Thank you. It's, it's really about um, that creativity, you know, and, and thinking exactly. outside of the box, you know, and I think really that's like the one of the biggest lessons that has come out of COVID-19 is, you know, really creatively thinking about how to um, how to deliver health care and how to make sure that there's still equitable health care that's accessible and is, is still is very much of quality and available to all. So thank you so much, Diana. Um, don't go away either. Maybe we have our panel discussion. <laughs> Up next, I'd like to invite um, Anna Vasovich from Arcadia, who's going to be talking about uh, patient engagement and some of the strategies we used during uh, COVID-19. Anna, are you there? Yep, I see you. I am. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if we can hop in the next slide. Uh, Anna Vasovich, by the way, Vice President of Customer Success at Arcadia. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with us, we're a healthcare data and software company. Uh, our focus and commitment is on helping our customers achieve success in value-based care and drive population health. So we help organizations assemble comprehensive and timely data sets. Uh, and we use that data to calculate quality measures, risk scores, impactability scores, uh, a range of key performance indicators. Uh, all the metrics that are really critical for informing leaders in the value-based care ecosystem around their performance and their opportunity. And we present those insights through analytics and care team workflow tools that are designed to help uh, frontline caregivers act on opportunities to improve their performance. So why are we talking about patient engagement? Uh, because this has been uh, a really key priority for many of our customers, and it's one of the things that's become a lot more challenging in 2020, and it's truly, uh, truly critical uh, for us to get this function really rolling smoothly, uh, both to support the COVID-19 vaccination efforts and to continue everything that healthcare organizations need to do in order to manage population health. So, why, why has this gotten so hard? You know, first and foremost, and Juana, if we can uh, grab the next slide here, uh, healthcare organizations have really lost in-person visits, which has always been our primary way of connecting with patients and maintaining that relationship. And patients faced really significant barriers to engaging in care. You know, there's been a mix of information out there on what's safe and what isn't. Uh, offices have been closed intermittently and a lot of patients are facing financial challenges. So there's a lot to overcome here, and we see the impact of this. You know, we see the fact that there's a lot less preventative care uh, that's, being, uh, that's, that's been administered in 2020, and that trend continues. Uh, we also saw lower rates of delivery for uh, chronic disease management. And if we hit the next slide, we actually even saw significant drops in acute care really highlighting the fact that patients aren't getting the care that they need. And that means that uh, healthcare providers and health plans have really had to step up their patient engagement efforts. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the new strategies that our customers developed. So we saw a number of public health campaigns uh, really oriented around raising awareness around COVID-19 trying to get really accurate and trustworthy information out there. And one of the things that we know from the studies is even if uh, some of this information is already available on the news and patients have probably seen it somewhere or another, having it come from a trusted source like your family physician can really make a big difference. Uh, we also saw a lot of organizations drive flu vaccinations, making sure that patients aren't overlooking this really critical step 
to try to reduce avoidable hospitalizations from the flu and make sure that hospitals had room for all the COVID cases that have been coming in this winter. But we also saw a focus on targeted care gap closure campaigns for preventative care. That includes well visits, childhood immunizations, cancer screenings. There's a really broad range of care there that might not seem critical right at the time, uh, but on a population level is incredibly important to make sure that we maintain and don't fall behind on. And one thing that's been really reassuring here is that we've also seen healthcare organizations uh, offer a good deal of information that we don't often think of as being directly connected to your physical health. So we saw health plans as well as providers uh, share information around accessing care through telehealth, uh, behavioral health hotlines, financial resources for underprivileged patients, particularly in Medicaid programs. Um, and that's been so critical because uh, it's probably more evident now than ever that uh, things like financial well-being, housing security, access to food, uh, the ability to manage your nutrition are absolutely critical to maintaining your health, uh, particularly at this difficult time. Uh, slide, please. Uh, and one of the key focuses here has been around having the right technology in place to execute this at scale. That means using automation in order to get these messages out rather than relying on care managers or call centers to reach a really broad set of patients. Um, it also means tools that can algorithmically identify patients uh, so that you can send the most right and relevant and appropriate message directly to the patient that it's going to make a difference for. So for some of our customers, that's meant targeting patients who have especially high risk for COVID complications with more detailed information and more resources to make sure that they know how to keep themselves safe. Uh, it also means identifying asthmatic patients and sending them messages around air quality warnings and how to keep your asthma in check when there are forest fires blazing in the, nor in the Northwest uh, and along the West Coast during the summer, as a number of our customers have done. Slide. So over the past year, uh, we've, sent about, we've sent a little over 2 million texts, and we've had especially high reach rates here. Uh, which has been due to the fact that we're leveraging extensive data sets and oftentimes the phone number that you have that the insurance company has on file might not be as up to date as what the primary care physician has in their EHR. So being able to leverage that full data set to reach the patient is really important. Uh, and then some of the areas where these campaigns have had really significant impact on population health has really been around closing those gaps uh, in preventative care. So that's chronic disease management, it's cancer screenings, it's getting patients in for annual wellness visits so that their care needs can be addressed in a really comprehensive manner. And as we look ahead on the next slide, our customers are thinking really critically about a couple of key areas. You know, obviously continuing to offer patients support as the pandemic continues. Um, bringing patients in for vaccinations as they become available, making sure that patients really understand um, the safety of the vaccine, the fact that why, it's, why we think it's so critical that the really large volumes of the population are vaccinated, uh, and getting patients the logistical information around where and when vaccines are available and how to schedule an appointment. And all of that is supplemented with ongoing messages around preventative care, trying to get that back on track as we start to get back to normal. Now, for all these efforts on the next slide, uh, we want to make sure that we're continuing to think about how we ensure equity in how care is delivered. And I wanna spend a little bit of time on some of the key pillars of that. First and foremost, there's a critical need for every organization at this point to have a focus on and a commitment to using that social determinants of health data that Diana talked about. Um, any organization needs a clear strategy for how that data is going to be captured and how it's going to be used to drive improvement in care. As we move forward, a big part of this is also monitoring for equity in the actual delivery of care. 
So when many of our customers look at their quality measures and see how many of their patients have had cancer screenings, how many of their hypertensive patients have their blood pressure in control, et cetera, they're frequently looking at that across race, across ethnicity, across language, to understand if there are pockets of the population where they need a really targeted plan in order to drive that improvement. Uh, and that's going to be especially critical in tracking COVID vaccinations. Because one of the things that we know very clearly is that the communities that have been most affected by this disease are also the communities that are likely to have a very reasonable skepticism of the medical establishment and of taking something that's new and that can easily be perceived as having been developed very quickly or perhaps not having been tested quite as much as one might envision uh, being the case. Um, and we, we have to make sure, you know, as, as we've all talked about, that the COVID vaccine reaches the communities that are most impacted by this pandemic in order for us to contain it and to start making progress. So as we think about actually starting to address that, you know, there's, there's the targeted support that a lot of organizations have put in place. Um, linking patients with wonderful community programs around food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, help in affording medications, and, you know, a really broad range there. But the other piece that we have to make sure is that all of our caregivers are also thinking about this. You know, we know that social determinants of health isn't something that we handle in a vacuum. It really needs to be integrated into the broader care plans around physical and behavioral health. So in working with diabetic patients, a doctor or a care manager has to understand how financial factors might play into their ability to manage their nutrition. Um, when we're reaching out to patients to try to get them in for their wellness visits, we need to make sure that we're also thinking about transportation barriers and how those may be holding patients back and offering that type of information up proactively. So we really want to make sure that uh, healthcare providers, practice staff, care managers, folks on member services on the health plan side, really everyone that's working with the patient to improve their care uh, is aware of social determinants of health that impact the patients and have tools and methodologies that they can leverage to address entire patient needs and think about the whole patient uh, as they're laying out the plan to managing the person's health. Any questions here? Thank you, Anna. That was that was great. Um, I do have one question. Um, how are you measuring, or are you? Is there even a way to measure um, equity in healthcare? You know, you've got these these different buckets and different levels of engagement and um, direct you know, direct targeting. So I'm wondering how how are you measuring that? You're monitoring, but I see how how do you? Yeah. How do you measure that? It's, it's, it's critical, again, because if we're not measuring it, we can't improve it, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's really upon every organization to think through what are the KPIs that are most relevant for tracking this. But some of the big ones we've seen are really the same types of measures that we see around population health. I mean, first and foremost, you know, it's about making sure that patients have continuous health care coverage. So if you have a patient population that's, um, that's, heavily, that's heavily using Medicaid, we know that there's a ton of issues with churn there. We know that it's very, uh, it's very challenging to, to make sure that patients actually stay on Medicaid for, you know, for a full year or for several years during the time that they're eligible uh, and that they're not losing their enrollment and their benefits because there's paperwork that hasn't been submitted or something like that. Um, and there's a lot of really great programs that uh, FQHCs in particular undertake in order to support their populations in getting and keeping their coverage. Um, so that's, that's a huge area. Other than that, you know, a lot of the customers we see are looking at when they look across, across their whole population, not just the folks they've seen in the past year or something like that, but looking at the patients that they've engaged with and however they define their population pool. Um, making sure that patients of different races, ethnicity, patients facing homelessness, et cetera, um, that they are receiving care at the same level, 
um, that they are having the same the same rates of annual wellness visits, same rates of vaccinations and cancer screenings. Also looking at the other side of that, uh, understanding if those patients are going to the emergency room more, which might suggest that they have other needs that aren't being addressed, um, mm -hmm. that there's an opportunity there for care management, et cetera. And a big part of that is also honestly monitoring a lot of the algorithms that tend to suggest patients uh, for those types of programs. One of the, two, one of the uh, big news items that we saw probably, probably about a year or so back is that a very common algorithm that identified patients as rising risk or rising cost for care management programs had a racial bias to it because it was looking at patients that had had high cost of care previously, which tended to be patients who looked like me, uh, who mm -hmm. can afford to access higher cost care because they have good coverage, et cetera. So making sure that we are keeping an eye on that and that we are very actively uh, implementing tools to counterbalance that um, and make sure that we're, that we're accounting for the fact that patients who are underprivileged and underserved are less likely to come up uh, as requiring our support and attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. Lots to think about. Um, and so last but not least, um, we have Danica Barr from Verily. She's the head of government and um, policy relations. Danica? Welcome. Welcome. Hello. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Thank you. Great. So thank you, Ehi and Juan A, for inviting me to this panel discussion. Um, I will give a, a look back at some of the community-based testing activities that, that Fearly um, has conducted and is continuing to conduct and its relationship between you know, a technology solution and and these gaps that we may find with folks who have uh, limited access to the technology. So I'll just start out with a um, uh, next slide with a little background on Verily. So Verily was founded at Google Life Sciences within Google X in, two, in 2013. We have a multidisciplinary team of clinicians, scientists, engineers, and strategic thinkers devoted to the mission of making healthcare better for everyone. We invest heavily in research programs in addition to commercial efforts because we care deeply about solving hard problems in science and increasing shared knowledge in healthcare. We are a fast growing company. We have about a thousand team members across the US and the EU and we're hiring. So there's lots of opportunity to grow with us. Next slide, please. Our mission is to make the world's health, health data useful so that people enjoy healthier lives. Um, converting data into knowledge at scale is our DNA and working with partners who have experience hopefully provides them with new insights and wisdom. Next slide. In order to achieve our mission of making the world's health data useful, we have built our leading end-to-end cloud-based technology platform to collect, organize, and activate health data. Every solution we build sits on a common platform, and it's across this platform that we collect data by building easy-to-use tools and inexpensive devices and technologies. We organize data by building software systems to store and query multidimensional complex data sets. And we turn data into action by developing data-driven insights and actionable interventions integrated into the point of care to activate change. Next slide, please. So it was March 11th, 2020, um, that the White House, Corona, uh, White House Coronavirus Task Force recommended a 30-day mitigation strategy for three counties in Washington State and Santa Clara County in California. Shortly after, Vera Lee was contacted by California Governor Gavin Newsom to contribute in any way that we could to the COVID-19 screening and testing efforts. Our team moved with great urgency to support the development of California community-based testing program. Our product, the Baseline COVID-19 testing program was born from Project Baseline. Project Baseline is a technology platform that supports research and community initiatives. 
the platform and the project team is focused on the human, uh, excuse me, they're focused on uh, ways to uh, engage people to contribute to the human health um, and to learn more about their own health. The baseline COVID-19 program is a connected solution uh, to support individuals from screening through testing and receipt of results, which is done under a physician direction. More than just the technology, the baseline COVID-19 program team responsibly rolled out um, community-based testing sites for sample collection in coordination with government authorities, qualified healthcare personnel who conduct testing, and testing labs that analyze the results. Next slide, please. So at our appointment-based drive-through baseline COVID-19 testing sites, a participant can complete testing in less than 10 minutes. Uh, the team learned a lot in the early days of establishing this program and thought about what were the best practices to inform the development of additional sites. So at the end of March, less than three weeks later, we published our first COVID-19 community-based testing program guide designed to help government officials, public health departments, and local communities establish drive-through testing and include instructions for integrating with the baseline COVID-19 program. It was uh, April that there was pretty wide recognition that COVID-19 disproportionately impacts minority, racial, and ethnic groups. So what we did was launch multiple new community-based testing sites with the state of California, the Rockefeller Foundation, and Community Organized Relief Effort, CORE. It's a nonprofit a relief organization founded by Sean Penn, dedicated to saving lives and strengthening communities affected by or vulnerable to the crisis. Our first new sites included Napa, and Bakersfield and Oakland to ensure better access for testing for farm workers and communities of color. Expanding testing capacity in partnership with community-based organizations that have built trust among historically marginalized groups was crucial to understanding, um, was crucial to ensuring that the members of the disease populations receive the testing they need. The CORE's outreach to farm workers represented an important milestone in increasing testing availability in rural areas, which are often isolated from major medical centers. In May, we collaborated with the California Department of Health to initiate mobile testing. In this case, when I say mobile, it's not your mobile phone. Think of an actual RV. So this mobile testing program was designed specifically to serve rural and under-resourced communities it's been used at multiple locations across the state. Testing operations through this program can be deployed rapidly and responsibly to remote or underserved areas and can be conducted in short periods of time if needed. Also in May, we launched assisted accounts. Assisted accounts are for individuals who have little or no access to the internet. And these sites were um, offered at a limited number of testing sites for underserved population this was first deployed in the San Francisco Tenderloin District, where we were able to serve, uh, test over 1,600 people in nine days. And there were about 20 sites in California that used the assistant accounts. Improving accessibility of our baseline COVID-19 website and screening platform is also a top priority. The program is available in Spanish and we are working on additional languages. We are continually working to enhance um, our technology for diverse groups, including people with visual disabilities, mobility limitation, cognitive disabilities, and those who are deaf or hard of hearing. The website has gone through a comprehensive accessibility assessment and testing with the support of our user experience designers and engineers who specialize, specialize in inclusive designs. Next slide, please. So, to date, we have tested over 2 million people that have been screened and tested for COVID-19 through, through the baseline testing program. We are winding down our efforts in community-based testing in California, 
But through our partnership with Rite Aid, we've expanded access to testing to over 400 sites across 16 states, and we've tested, continue to test millions of people at a rate of about 10,000 people per day. We also recently expanding access to testing to children who are age four and up. This is a free service and in many locations, it is the only accessible testing option for people. True to our research roots, over 100,000 participants in the testing program have opted to be a part of our COVID-19 research program. In December, we announced that we are partnering with Pfizer and the Duke Clinical Research Institute on a long-term surveillance study of the Pfizer, BioNTech, and COVID-19 vaccine in frontline workers. Uh, this study is called Hero Together. Um, thank you so much for your interest in the work that we've done over the past 10 months, and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Danica. What I find interesting about um, your experiences with community-based testing is it's very similar to what's happening now with, with the vaccine efforts. Um, there's still this, this heavy emphasis on engaging the community and accessibility and, and creating this awareness. Um, and there's, there's a lot of connective tissue. I have a feeling that in six months, when I reach out to you again, you're gonna tell me that your model is gonna be used for community-based vaccinations. You know, uh, because it's, it, it really is, it really is so, so very important. But what I want to, what I want to ask you is, and I'll invite the panelists to come back now. Um, data, data seems to be at the center of, of everybody's uh, presentation. Um, without data, we don't know where to go, where people are, you know, what their needs are. And, and so with my question to you, Demika, is with the type of um, technology that you're using, do you see that, where do you see it going in the future? That's a great question. So the, I think the possibilities are endless as long as we are able to use the data in a way that um, ensures the privacy of the person who is providing the data. We've used the data for our community-based testing in ways that have been very helpful to our partners at the county level maybe in ways that initially we didn't anticipate data use. Mm -hmm. So using our screening and testing tool, we are collecting information about types of employment. We're collecting information about uh, where a person lives and it helped to inform where best to apply the technology. So just one example is when we were happily launched a drive-through site in, um, in Santa Clara County, once we sat down with a county official the county official was able to look at anonymized data, understand the zip codes and say, we, we are missing a hot spot within our county. And we made a couple of adjustments. One was thinking about having a mobile site in that county in the, in the zip code area where they knew there was a, a high rate of, of, of COVID and transmission and also altering our testing hours. We're a technology company. We primarily work nine to five. When we thought about launching our testing sites, we thought, let's launch these nine to five. Mm -hmm. But the folks who needed the testing actually needed to receive testing either early in the morning or when they were, when they were um, coming home from work. So I think it's using the data that we're collecting with our community partners to help um, kind of solve these problems that we don't see as a technology company to uh, decrease some of these gaps in care. No, thank you. That's, that's, I'm, that's a really great answer. So my question to all the panelists, um, there's been one common theme uh, throughout the that you all have talked about in addition to data, and it's this, it's this notion of partnership and collaboration. So my question to all of the panelists are, what type of innovation and partnership um, are vital to sustain the momentum to continue to focus on, on integrating healthcare and social services and addressing FDOH and, and achieving health equity? And I'll leave it to everyone to, to answer that question first. You know, I think uh, I can go ahead and start from our side in terms of what we're seeing with healthcare providers as well as health plans. Um, I think there are two part, two sides to this, uh, to kind of the spectrum here and the, and the process that are really key. Uh, where partnerships can be really valuable. One is on actually getting the social determinants of health data. Uh, and, you know, Dana did a great job of talking through just the, the level of complexity 
um, and all, you know, the, the very broad range of factors that we have to work with here. Um, and that's, that's challenging for anyone to capture. You know, we've had a lot of, we've seen a lot of really great initiatives of having care managers uh, capture this information, um, of having, um, trying, you know, you know, trying to get providers to capture this at the point of care. But we know, you know, we know exactly how much a provider is struggling at a visit, you know, even with someone relatively healthy um, who has relatively straightforward needs. So, you know, I think that the more that there are, that there are opportunities for organizations to capture this data uh, and leverage publicly available information, the more of a head start you get on that. Because ultimately, if you've captured, you know, items like food, food or housing insecurity for a tenth of the patients that you've seen, there's mm -hmm. a lot that you're missing there. And you're, again, starting to lean towards knowing the needs of the patients that are already coming to you. And we've got to make more of an effort to meet patients on their terms. Setting the yeah. capture of that data is one side. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I just wanted to add to that, Anna, because I think you hit on it perfectly. I think um, using, you know, the other place that we see a huge need for collaboration is also marrying data sets. Um, and that's certainly something that, you know, we have expertise and support a lot of organizations in. But oftentimes, you know, when we sit down with a Medicaid agency, they, they have the data, but it's not usable. Um, they've got social determinants data in, um, you know, in the screeners that Anna described. You've got a, a great organization doing work on the ground, um, like Damika described, but it's not necessarily in the, you know, health system um, or sorry, data system. And so just really, I think, I encourage people to think about um, how are you connecting data um, between your systems, you know, and, and if you have questions about that or want more information, I'm happy to talk to you about it. But I think the biggest takeaway is there's a lot of data out there. And I think we're getting to the point where everyone is convinced data is important, but making it actionable and connecting it down to one individual that you can look at an entire data story for. Yeah. Let me Dr. build on that and add uh, briefly, if I may. Yes, please. Go ahead, Dr. McGinn. Um, the... Uh, and I'll comment on two dimensions, the, um, the organizational dimension and the data dimension. Uh, on the organizational dimension, uh, it's clear that uh, we need to uh, take on our um, activities uh, with a full commitment to partnership. We've seen what's happened, for example, in the warp speed activity in the development of, uh, of a vaccine at warp speed. So that the notion of working uh, to, across organizations uh, around common themes um, it, it is vital. We have um, a group of CEOs, a part of the Na National Academy of Medicine Leadership Consortium, uh, who are committed to uh, their mantra is aligning forces uh, for a health system which is effective, efficient, equitable, and continuously learning. Um, and uh, we need to take advantage of that spirit. And so on the data front, um, the, uh, what we want is in the continuous learning uh, uh, universe that we now have the prospect of accessing. Data is the, both the circulatory system and the nervous system for success. Mm -hmm. We want, in principle, a, a, to position data, health data, as a core utility for the nation, just like our gas and electricity uh, and our highway system. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to have trust um, and governance. So it's very important that we develop a governance enterprise that will allow common pooling across uh, organizations uh, uh, of uh, uh, available data, and most importantly, trust at the individual level. So the most important partnership in, uh, throughout the whole enterprise is partnership with the individual patient and family, mm -hmm. so that that trust quota builds and we can move toward the, what's possible. Absolutely. That's, I think that's a really, really great way to frame this. I mean, that's that's a new way for us to think about healthcare. You know, not only how we receive healthcare, but how healthcare is, is delivered, um, creating the partnership with the patient. And I think Tamika said it very well too, converting data into knowledge. I, I love that that idea that everything that we're learning, Dr. McGinnis, you said this as well, we're learning health system, everything we're learning is now, it's, it's, it's improving. 
day by day. And we have a long way to go. We don't know when our journey is going to end. Um, you know, we have 12 months of, of, of lessons behind us, some good, some bad. Um, you know, that means we have 12 months of opportunity to, to be better, you know, going forward. Um, and with that, we are almost out of time. Uh, it's, and it's a shame that we're just going to get on a roll. Um, but I do want to thank all of my panelists um, for joining today. For anyone who's listening, please, uh, you can continue to submit your questions, 